Yeah, we are online. Let's see. Hmm, the YouTube is not yet. Yep, yep, okay. Okay, um, so uh, good morning everyone um, and good evening uh, for Taiwan side. And um, so uh, I would like to thank you all for participating in this panel. And, um, and um, this is a World Youth Movement, movement online panel online discussion. And uh, the Harvard Youth Files Shift program uh, is a program that's trying to facilitate it by the World Movement for Democracy. And it supports emerging democratic leaders from around the world committed to build their leadership skills, enhancing their own, uh, organizational talents and harvesting their potential. And in this program, uh, there were there are three young activists each year who we'll spend four months in uh, Washington, D.C. in the World, of, World Movement for Democracy's Secretary, and they will conduct research and learn lessons from activists involved in the democratic movement around the world. And um, my name is Johnson Yuan. I am the current Perfect Youth Fellows. Uh, it's an honor to that we can invite two speakers today, Yiling Chu and also Kosei uh, Chigani. Uh, they are all experienced uh, activists from Taiwan and South Africa, respectively. And um, so, um, let's see. Uh, for Yiling, um, she is a activist from Taiwan, Secretary General of Taiwan Association for Human Rights, board members of Convenience Watch. And she's active in uh, Sunflower Movement in 2014. And she's a uh, graduate from sociology at the National Tsinghua University. Uh, for Kozi, uh, he is a former student leader in South Africa. And he's active in the 2015 Free Must Fault movement, um, which is a student movement and trying to get rid of um, the tuition fee and also educational reforms in uh, universities. He's also president of Include uh, Free Hut, a student led movement. And right now he's studying in Oxford University uh, for his Master of. Um, public policy. So now I will give the floor to, I will give uh, the time to Yiling and she will explain more of her experiences and uh, his insight about leadership, about organizational skills and the obstacle that she faced it, Taiwanese activists faced it. Um, so yeah, I will give the floor to you. Thank you. Um, okay, um, good evening and good morning, <laughs> everyone. I'm um, Yiling from Taiwan. Um, it's my pleasure to share about my experience um, as an NGO worker who participates in the uh, Taiwan Sunflower Movement in um, um, 2014. And um, I would I think uh, Johnson already gave us mm -hmm. some questions. So I think I will just follow the questions uh, and um, to do my presentation. So um, the first question is about uh, what's the challenge to the movement leadership? Um, like, like, as, like we have seen in a lot of um, social movement uh, in the contemporary society, like occupation, uh, occupation uh, Wall Street in the United States, or uh, we also maybe see a similar um, um, for, uh, for phenomena in the uh, umbrella movement in Hong Kong and sunflower movement in Taiwan, and also maybe more and more social movement in, in Taiwan, we will see like anti-nuclear movement. Um, it shows a lot of um, characters. I, I just uh, list here, uh, like the centralized, the constructor, the heroized, the stagealized, <laughs> and humanization. Some some. Some sentences there are in, in Chinese, so sometimes it's, it's difficult to <laughs> translate into English. But, it, well, it, it seems like more, uh, the more and more social movement, um, usually in the past, um, a lot of social movement are organized by the uh, 
um, professional or, or NGOs um, or an organized group. But nowadays, you will see that uh, more and more, especially like the occupation movement, um, they will be more emphasized that this kind of um, character. So, yeah, like on the occupation in Wall Street, um, they, they will say that they will emphasize that um, the decision making should be open to the public and everyone should have a, a place to um, announce their opinions. Or also like um, on the sunflower, uh, on the in the uh, umbrella movement in Hong Kong, uh, we also hear about that they don't want one big stage. They want every everyone everywhere is the stage, and everyone's opinions could be heard um, by the public. And also um, in the uh, sunflower movement in, in Taiwan, although we we still have some people like. Um, um, persons, um, they will be um, recognized as a, a symbol to the movement. But um, you, you still um, hear a lot of, um, you know, maybe criticize or a lot of uh, different opinions. Um, like, and also like uh, during the Sound Farm movement, we we have three different uh, stage and three different places. So this, the whole movement is not only happened in in the in the parliament building, also around the parliament building, uh, in the Qingdao um, East Road, and also in the Jinan Road, um, they, we also have uh, two uh, different stage, and a lot of people can participate outside the parliament and join the social movement by their own ways, and also um, yeah, this is also a. Um, place happened in the Jinan Road. And um, on the Jinan Road, there are also other, um, how to say that, other um, event was organized by other NGOs or uh, individuals, they called uh, Jian Men Jie Bang Chu, um, which means they, 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 um, they announced that they are not belongs to any um, NGOs or any student groups in the and, um representative uh, groups on the media and they want to talk about other issues um, like a, about the free trade uh, issue um, yeah, uh, in, in the whole movement. It's not only about the anti-Chinese or um, about the uh, cross-trade agreement issue. So yeah, and also you will see that um, more and more um, event was maybe organized by other individuals. So like the uh, uh, March 24, um, there are some uh, people, they, 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 um, they organized on the internet and they uh, called the uh, participants on the Song movement to um, occupy the Yuan and sit in in the um, square in the Executive Yuan. So that is a, that's another um, event organized by other people. And mm. also, like the 4th of um, April and when, um, is also another event <laughs> by the netizen. Um, a lot of people, they are angry about the, some of the uh, uh, some of the people, like, like older uh, people from the uh, Free Taiwan Party, he was dismissed by the police, by the police. Uh, arbitrary. So, uh, arbitrary. They, so, so they raised, so they, they called the, uh, uh, the crowded people to gathering in front of the police station and make a contact inside the police station. So more and more um, event or protest um, usually is not organized, not organized. only one um, major uh, NGO or student movement by only one leadership. <laughs> so this is a very uh, challenge to the um, traditional way of the leadership. And during the Sunflower movement, uh, uh, although we, we have a decision-making group, 
which uh, include 10 different uh, NGOs uh, representatives and also the other 10 students uh, representatives in the making uh, decision making group. But sometimes it will seem the traditional way of um, decision making is not very efficient. Um, you know, when you face uh, so many uh, emergencies happens every day, and you have to re respond to the media every every day, even uh, maybe uh, every few hours. So sometimes it's during the meeting. There is not enough time to discuss our strategy or our objects. Uh, carefully. Uh, carefully, and uh, if also uh, the representative of NGOs or students in the meeting is changed every day, mm. so who is the responsible to the decision? Sometimes it's very difficult to clarify. Also, because during the Sunflower Movement, there's a lot of people, no matter the NGOs or the students, they are we are all lack of sleeping time. So during the the meeting. It's not a good quality to discuss and make the decision. Mm. And what's the lesson we learned when we face um, so many different uh, opinions uh, among the meetings or um, during the uh, movement? Um, yeah, during the Sunflower movement, we, we try to um, introduce the deliberative discussion um, on. Uh, the outside of the parliament. So um, in the uh, Qingdao East Road area and also in the Jinan Road, um, there are a lot of discussion groups uh, was organized, uh, sometimes by NGOs and sometimes by their uh, professors from or students uh, from university. So we try to encourage the um, public to um, participate the movement um, by speaking out of their opinions, because uh, like in the beginning of the movement, um, um, usually we are doing like a one-way speech from the stage. So usually we will invite a lot of um, speakers or maybe uh, music bands to do the speech or um, sharing some ideas or um, um, perform some um, Films or uh, music on the stage, but you you will find out that um, the public um, under the stage they are they, they also they they want to they want to speak, <laughs> so more and more people will raise their hand and even they will go to the side of the stage and say I I, I want to say something, so after that we we, we uh, decide to change the one way. Um, um, speech, we try to organize more and more discussion group um, on the Jinan Road and Qingdao East Road. Even we try to um, encourage them to discuss, like when we raise the issue that we need a, 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 a new act to uh, monitoring the cross trade agreement, and we try to um, submit a new uh, version from the NGO's uh, um, perspective uh, about the draft, and we also invite the public in, um, uh, on the street um, to join us together to see the articles and see um, what um, their opinion about the draft. And also uh, during during the this kind of group discussion, um, we think it's very interesting and sometimes it's very efficient that you can compromise some opinions, which is more ex uh, extreme. Um, extremism, and we can also um, use this way to make the public um, have a space to participate in the decision making. And yeah, the last question is, is about the obstacle and the difficulties to observing the politicalized individuals into organizations. Um, we have to say that uh, it's true uh, because. During the whole uh, movement, um, it's too many. It's too many things and emergencies. You have to respond, and so we think we um, we missed the most important um, part, which is to um, 
organized the people on the street uh, very uh, in a very organized way. So until the last day before we decided to leave, um, we started to um, ask people to uh, write down their contact information and um, that let them know that we will keep going to monitor all the things and they can join us um, after the movement. They still can participate as uh, any any one of us NGOs and um, as a staff or as a volunteer, they can keep um, join the public uh, issue with us. But sometimes you will see that most of the mm -hmm. active and maybe they have more ambitions about to change some things. Um, the yeah, some of, you, you will see that after the movement, many young people they joined the political party. Yeah, because maybe they think that it's it's a very it's the fast fast way to making change. And when you join the NGO, sometimes it's too slow and it's a long process to to change the policy or to change the politics. And also, um, as 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 an NGO worker, usually uh, it's a lonely journey and no spotlight. <laughs> so yeah, so you will see that after the Sunflower Movement, many young activists they joined maybe the DPP or um, or some uh, small uh, new uh, political party um, as their uh, job. Um, yeah, so I think it's it's really a a top uh, uh, difficulties for us, like NGOs, to um, observe these uh, active people to join us. But um, I I still have to say that uh, after the Sun Sun Flower Movement, there are more and more uh, individuals and uh, students. They they still join uh, many NGOs as a volunteers. And they participate a lot of different issues uh, with different NGOs. So um, it's not only maybe the famous <laughs> um, individuals we see on uh, the media, but there are also a lot of um, individuals. They because they participate in the Sunflower Movement, so they realize that it's very important to um, participate the public um, issue and even yeah to to speak out by themselves um, and to concern about a lot of um, issues and policies so um, so for for my perspective I think although we didn't observe many um, famous <laughs> um, individuals into maybe some NGOs but you you can see that uh, everyone they they try to find their way and their rule to still keep um, their patient and, uh, on the on these issues, and they try to find their ways to keep making change. So uh, for uh, for me, I would think, um, although the experience is face, we face a lot of um, challenge and difficulties on maybe the decision making and the leadership, but the whole process is give us a very good lesson and. Um, tell, um, which te t um, teach us how to cooperate with the general public together and to discuss with them together and to make something with them together. So yeah, that's my presentation. Mm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, before we go to Cozy, uh, I have a couple questions that um, you can uh, think about it and then we can come back after uh, both three of us have finished our presentation. Um, so you mentioned it was really stunning and also amazing that I heard you saying during the Taiwan Sunflower Movement, uh, the public was invited uh, to the stage, uh, to, to an open area to discuss uh, the trade agreement. So how do you um, come up with a decision making mechanisms? So when uh, the people express this, their opinions, how do you uh, how do you train uh, the general public uh, opinions in there into uh, policy or decision making for the movement? And secondly, uh, what are the factor do you think um, are the factor for people not trusting 
um, a single leader? Is it because of the spatial differences in um, the movement or is it because of uh, differences in expectations? Um, so yeah, for now I do have like two, these two reflections and uh, we can come back later. So right now we are going to turn uh, to Kosi. Hi, Kosi, are you here? Hello? Hello. There we go. Sorry, I, I, I was talking and I thought my speaker was on, but I, I hope you can hear me now. Okay, okay. Yep. 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 We can hear okay. you now. Okay. Um, so I was thinking yesterday about how to describe the internal dynamics of and the challenges that we face for Fismas 4, but I realized that in order to do that, I need to un explain how Fismas 4 organized itself originally, otherwise things won't make any sense. So I might like jump between the questions um, if you don't mind, but Fismas 4 is a interesting organization, uh, interesting social movement rather, because it's kind of broken down particular barriers in which we see how we organize social movements. So whereas Ailing was talking about how this is organized and her movement is organized through the use of like NGOs. Um, ours was, the best way to think of it is that Fees Must Fall was a banner in which autonomous organizations could fall under in order to achieve a particular demand that was universal. Now, I know that sounds like a mouthful, but I can break it down a bit more. So the way Fees Must Fall was structured was originally the, the, the movement was a solidarity movement with a particular university um, in South Africa that was undergoing a fee negotiation, so tuition fees, negoti negotiating tuition fees. And that negotiation essentially fell apart. And the students at that university reacted by deciding that they would shut down the university. Um, so they would bring the university to a standstill. Now that happened on the Wednesday, I forget the exact date now, but a Wednesday in October. And by the Monday, the following week, we had eight other universities who had in the morning of the pro of that Monday decided that we will have, we will show solidarity with this university by shutting down our own universities. Now, this is where things became quite unique for Fismas 4, right? So you have eight different universities who were not communicating with each other over the weekend or prior to this, all spontaneously deciding that they would use a shutdown tactic of their own respective universities um, in order to show solidarity. But then through the use of social media, and this is quite important because it was quite natural the way it happened. It wasn't as if there was one person um, or one group um, who can say that they're the leaders of the entire movement across the country. They, it, it's, it's impossible. If anyone was to say that to you, I would call them a liar um, straight off the bat. Um, but you have these different universities making autonomous decisions, but using social media to coordinate what the demand is. And this happened over a three hour time period of making the issue trend over Twitter and over social media, and then leveraging social media to get different students' views about a very simple, clear demand, which at the time was free education. Now, that demand has evolved as years has gone on um, to free decolonial education, but the very spirit of it stays the same. Now, the beauty of Fismas 4 and how we've organized in this way is that it, the structure, that type of structure has stayed the same with certain principles transferring across multiple different universities. So the structure is at each university, you have your own Fismas 4 banner. And within that Fismas 4 banner, you have multiple different organizations that fit in. Most of these organizations are primarily university student-based organizations. Um, and a lot of them are partisan. So you have political parties whose student bases would all participate in Fismas 4. Right? So you'll have traditionally student bodies or student organizations that would never speak to each other, ever. Just, they would never protest with each other. They would never organize with each other. You have them working together 
to achieve an obtainable goal because they realize that this is the one opportunity that they'll have to get free education in the country, um, which is an amazing thing to get political parties on polar opposites agreeing on one particular demand almost against the wishes of the mother party or the mother body of each of these parties. You also then had individual students who for a variety of reasons, South Africa has been going through an interesting period in which young people have started mobilizing in different ways. Um, we, I describe them as must fall movements or people who would describe themselves as fallists. So these are students who are not politically aligned but have a particular anger towards the country and the direction that it's taking and believe they can use this form of protest um, as a way of highlighting these particular issues. Right? So you have a movement where at each university you have different political parties, um, different students, independent students, who all decide that regardless of our differences around ideology, we all agree that we want free education within South Africa because of the issues that we face in the country. Now, what that does is that it creates interesting obstacles and difficulties for us. Um, and, but it makes it very, very easy. And I, the fourth question around absor absorbing politicized individuals, it made it very, very easy for us to absorb politicized individuals, right? Because the demand was very, very simple. There was nothing complicated about it. Um, the movement was extremely, I wouldn't say non-partisan, but was non-partisan in spirit. So the idea was that it was opened to any individual regardless of your political background. So you would have beautiful scenes, I think, fantastic scenes of students marching in their thousands um, with the leaders, the, the leaders, if you had to call them that, at each university coming from each political party and other individuals. So it was interesting, getting people into the protest wasn't a challenge. Um, simply because, A, we made it a space that was very, very open to everyone, um, and B, we were using the idea that even if you use social media to transfer the message, so if you're not physically present, you transferring the message through social media but, or talking about it over social media makes you part of the movement regardless. Um, and lastly, we also shifted heavily away from the idea of becoming an Occupy movement. Um, so though we used occupation as a tool, we only use it as a tool for meetings rather than the actual form of protest, if that makes sense. Um, and that pretty much happened at most universities where particular buildings were occupied, but the protest never stayed within that building. I mean, you would always have students there just in case the police wanted to remove you, but the protests were always targeted at centers of authority against the states or the protests would go into the streets of the country as a way of showing the rest of the country and not keeping the debate or protest based on the university, but you make the protest a national issue. So because of this, it makes our internal structure very, very interesting. Um, and it makes it very, very different from other movements and how they organize themselves. Um, so firstly, to answer the, the, the second question of how effective is the decision making between these groups within us, um, each university, traditionally, and some universities are a bit different, there's one or two that are a bit different, but they're, they're more outliers than the rule. But most people will use a horizontal leadership structure. Now, I have my own opinions about this, and I've written about this back at home as well. Um, but each university, the idea was because of the nonpartisan structure of the, of the movement, we wanted to shy away from the idea that one political party was in charge of the movement. So because of that, when you walked into an occupied space where we were holding a mass meeting, all decisions were made in the mass meeting. Um, we didn't allow for outside or pe outsiders to influence the decisions of the meeting. In fact, the meetings were quite secretive to an extent, um, which is very, very hard. Imagine having a room filled with 800 people and telling all 800 people that you're not allowed to tweet or make a Facebook post or share whatever discussions that are happening inside these walls. Um, you can imagine that's like a very difficult task, but because people understood the message, people kept to their word. So a lot of our decisions were made in-house in private meetings among students. And within those meetings, you had a completely horizontal structure 
um, where certain students, each political party was essentially given the opportunity to speak and make their case around how we should organize, how we should protest, um, and all debates that would happen would happen in that room. But any decision that you make is binding and you take it going forward. Um, any mistakes that you make after the meeting regarding maybe the protest went in a direction that wasn't planned by the mass meeting, you wouldn't air those grievances in public, you would come back into a private space and, and discuss how we went wrong, why we went wrong, and reassess the decisions that we've made. Now, there's issues with that system, obviously. Um, the idea that there's a horizontal leadership structure um, is almost, I, I haven't come across a social movement, maybe Ealing might, Ealing might have an alternative to this, so she might add to this question, is even with a horizontal leadership structure, you still have leaders present. Now, whether these leaders are faceless leaders um, or visible leaders um, becomes quite interesting. And that was one of the challenges that we faced, especially when we tried to reconcile differences within factions, where you could have particular faces or students who became very, very popular, seeming to be leaders. And the backlash was, well, no one elected you as a leader, right? The media often in South Africa would has a tendency of highlighting individuals to lead a protest or highlighting that a protest was organized by an individual. And in traditional fashion, when we had Fees Must Fall, certain students across the country were highlighted as, you are the face of Fees Must Fall, therefore you must be the leader of Fees Must Fall. And at the beginning, we leveraged that, but we realized it wasn't sustainable. And a lot of students started backlashing against the idea. And, I, and I'm actually quite happy that students backlashed against the idea because it keeps, it keeps people true and it allows people not to assume leadership if you haven't been elected. Now, the biggest long-term obstacle for this is that um, your organization starts falling apart underneath a horizontal leadership structure. I'm, I do not believe a horizontal leadership structure um, can be used to maintain a movement over the long term especially the type of movement that we have. Um, but there's a lot of hesitance um, to, to, to vote people in or to delegate some sort of leaders of some sort um, because of the fear that it could be taken up by a political party and it essentially gives the political party the reins to this entire movement when it's nonpartisan in spirit. So that was one of the issues that we faced um, and continue to face. Um, another one is the fighting for the name. So at the beginning, I said that fees must fall is seen as a banner or a particular demand that students and student groupings can fall underneath. Now, whoever controls the narrative of the banner controls the movement. So you'll have at particular universities, certain political parties being more prevalent than others, and that creates its own dynamic. Um, but when these youth different universities try to come together, it becomes very, very difficult because now you're no longer having a discussion within your university. You're having a discussion about who controls the movement on a national level. And that, that is a challenge that the movement hasn't been able to get over. And, and I'm very, very interested to hear from you, from your side and everyone else's views about how they would, how they would get around such a problem where at a local level, political party antagonisms and personal issues can be resolved to an extent. But when you elevate the discussion to a national movement, which Fees Must Fall is, those type of discussions don't happen anymore and they tend to fall apart, which is quite interesting. Um, and that, for me, just to, and I don't want to take up too much time, so I don't want to do that, but some of the challenges that we faced were as I mentioned, the political antagonisms, um, but the biggest challenge was trying to change the narrative um, of the protest. So initially the protest, and I'm sure every activist can relate to this, initially the, we were seen as, as ridiculous students who didn't know what they were talking about. Some of us were described as terrorists, um, fools, we were, so many different words, so many different insults. Um, and we were losing the narrative of what was happening. And the challenge was how to change that narrative back in our favor. Now, a few things happened and a few lucky incidences happened. And we also had a police force that was 
crazy. There's no other way to describe it. Uh, a police force that's untrained and didn't know how to handle protests that started shooting at students in, in many ways and attacking students. And that helped change the narrative against, um, that was going against us in our favor. And what was interesting was, and this is the internal politics, I guess, and an internal challenge is, what do you now do with this narrative? Who controls the narrative going forward? Um, who decides how we build on this narrative? If one university in another province, and like I said, we have 24 universities in South Africa, and out of the 24, 18 were active participants in this movement. And each university makes its own decision. So if one university burns something or burns a library, how does the action of the one university impact the decisions of all the other universities? Um, how do you, as one particular university, tell another university or another fees must fall group that they can't behave in X, Y, Z manner because it ruins the national narrative that you're creating? And that was a huge challenge that we face. How do you control this narrative that essentially has each autonomous university influencing the narrative continuously? And it's eventually we got to a point where we were starting to lose the national narrative. And that became a difficult of how do you now regain that? Who gets to decide that we've lost the national narrative? Some students had the argument of saying, um, so what if we lose the national support? Our issue is not about national support. Our issue is about making sure that students are not kicked out of university. Um, other people would say that you need the national support in order to change the national policies. Now, and this is the most important thing, because not many people realize just how big this was. There's very few examples in the world and in the history of the world where nationally coordinated protest that is essentially against the state or demanding the state to do something right, or to take a policy decision or to change a policy, right, there's no evidence, I haven't found any of any movement on a Monday making a demand for a change in national policy that on the Friday of that same week is essentially accepted by the government. Mm. And, and that's the, the power. Now, it wasn't a full free education, but they gave us a, a huge win in one week. Now, that creates that belief that you can constantly make that type of change by simply antagonizing against the state. And that's where you hit internal dynamics, where some students will say, well, we bulldozed before and we won. And other students will say, well, we bulldozed before and we won, but we didn't get everything what, that we wanted. And if we want everything that we want, we have to have a more light-footed attempt or approach to solving the issues. And burning down a university library doesn't solve that issue. Mm. And this is where the internal dynamics started coming in of which university gets to represent the voice of all the universities. Um, how do you decide that in a horizontal leadership structure where there's no national body? Um, and, and that's interesting. And some of the lessons I think we can learn from this is not to hold on to horizontal leadership for the sake of horizontal leadership, um, but hold on to horizontal leadership as long as it is pushing your movement organization in the direction that you want to. As soon as that structure no longer does that, we should be brave enough to put yourselves out there and say, we need to think differently. This is not to say that you need um, five people in charge of everything, but you can't just assume that changing the structure of the leadership, the leadership structure of the movement, you can't assume that by changing that, automatically things would fall apart. Um, and you need a bit of trust. Um, and that's one of the lessons I learned in particular about how to try and build that trust, acknowledging that students are very, very hesitant of simply giving power to someone and that person becoming super famous and all the other students' efforts and sacrifices get forgotten. That's one of the things. Um, and I think I can end there. I'm not sure if I, if I add anything else, whether it'll be of any more use, but um, just in conclusion, it's just Fees Must Fall is a very unique movement, at least in my mind. I haven't seen many movements that, are all, that have its type of organizational structure of extremely autonomous, extremely decentralized, 
and uses social media and Twitter in particular as a hub of sharing information as well as making decisions on a national level. Not so much in a university level, but on a national level. Um, and yeah, let me end there. Okay. Thank you. Wow. The experience is really interesting. Um, so I really resonate that when you say that uh, activists or uh, participants of protests, they should not uh, hold on to horizontal structure leaderships for the sake of horizontal leadership. And um, a lot of time social movement, it requires a lot of strategic and also tactical shift. And uh, but it is really difficult because there is always path depend dependencies for social movement. So when a horizontal structure have already established it, um, a lot of time people will stick with the structure. So my questions for you to um, for our discussion later to you is uh, when you say there are decisions making uh, through mass meeting, were there any potential risk? of uh, infiltrations uh, and how long is those mass meeting? The reason I ask about the durations of mass meeting is because the Occupy Wall Street, they try to do the same thing too. And uh, people who are in the occupation zone, they are asked to join the General Assembly, but then the General Assembly uh, lasts for eight hours every day and it really discourages people to um, participate in it. The other problem is, um, how do you, uh, you, you mentioned about the mass meeting is the decisions abiding. And uh, I imagine there are a lot of students who haven't uh, participated into the mass meeting. So uh, when they didn't express their opinions, how the decision making group or the mass meeting try to bind their decisions to people who haven't participated into the meetings. And um, one quick answer, I think, uh, for your questions of how to get around of the personal issues or uh, geographical differences, uh, I think we need to uh, clarify that, like, who is creating the narrative? Is it an individual's de uh, decisions by one particular university, uh, or is it like, like, is it um, the collective decisions by? the university alone. And if it is uh, the later one, which is a uh, one particular university's um, opinion, then I think there must be, uh, there have to be a dialogue, uh, which is the experiences from uh, Tunisia. When Tunisians, they are uh, after the judgment revolutions, there were so many differences uh, between geographical uh, different different provinces uh, they actually held a lot of uh, dialogue groups which they uh, put all those delegates from different district and provinces into one place and then they um, trying to discuss on one issues only for three days uh, and in those process they actually uh, facilitate their mutual understandings and so a lot of consensus were made in there. So this is my lecture uh, uh, answer. We will come back to your fresh refreshing of my uh, questions to you. And now I'm going to introduce a bit of my uh, movement, which is the Umbrella Movement. And I have prepared one slide, just so on. OK. So. Um, in 2014, there was a huge movement in uh, Hong Kong, and uh, it lasts for two and a half months. Though in those two and a half months, people occupy public roads and highway. Uh, there were more than a million of Hong Kong people in a 7.3 million population have participated the movement at a certain point. And now, um, but during the, this two and a half months occupation, there were a lot of internal dynamic, just like the other uh, movement. And the background for uh, the background for the movement, the umbrella movement, was um, Hong Kong is um, okay. I just found out I didn't share the slides. All right, okay, so. 
I think everyone can see the slides now. Um, the background of the umbrella movement is uh, we have to talk about the China Hong Kong relationship. Uh, Hong Kong was a colony of Britain since 19th century and not until 1997 it is returned it to the People's Republic of China. Uh, however, the, these two places that their lifestyles and their social systems are quite different from each other. So um, they have to uh, there are uh, a special treatment to uh, Hong Kong, which is agreed by uh, both UK and also China side. And Hong Kong became a special administrative zone and governed by a uh, their own mini, mini constitutions. In the mini constitutions, there were actually one clause saying that the Hong Kong people can elect their own government through free and fair elections. Uh, however, like uh, this is 20 years after the Hanover, which is in uh, 1997, the promises were not upheld. The promises were not realized by the Chinese government or the Hong Kong government. So in 2013, there were a lot of uh, social movement and protests and demonstrations. And there was an idea raised by an academia from the uh, University of Hong Kong. And they say, so we should use a civil disobedient action, civil disobedient occupation to achieve uh, institutional reform. So the main goal of um, the umbrella movement is always universal suffrage and free elect uh, electoral democracy. And in this diagram, you can say you can see um, in the lowest level, the district level, uh, is a free and fair elections, but in a parliamentary level. Only half of them are free and fair uh, and distributed according to geographical constituencies, while the other half it is actually controlled by a functional constituencies. Most, most of the seats in here are reserved it, um, to professionals or a elite class uh, that most of the seats are want by the poll government side. And in the highest level, which is the government uh, level, the chief executive, which is the head of government, it is not free and fair election at all. Um, people cannot participate in it. Uh, ordinary people cannot want for elections. Only 1,200 people are able to nominate and uh, elect the head of government. So this is the background of the umbrella movement. It is because of the constant this. Uh, appointment and also this encouragement of uh, realizing democracy in Hong Kong that people finally have to occupy uh, the main role and um, trying to uh, pressure up the government to realize a, a full implementation of democracy. What we encounter during the movement is um, the whole umbrella movement was a 79 days of uh, occupation, but it was succeeded from a 15 months long of uh, civil disobedience campaign, uh, which is initiated by Occupying Central Movement, which is a organization. And in this um, organization model, I was I would call it structure based network movement. The whole idea of civil disobedience is. Uh, raised it by the Occupy OCLP movement. And that they are trying to connect with other civil society groups, political parties, and student groups, and form as a coalition to mobilize their own uh, memberships to join the movement. While at the same time, it is not just about mobilizing the membership of student groups, political parties, or civil society groups. It is because some political parties, some civil groups, and student groups, they have reputations um people trust them uh so even people who are not members of these groups are mobilized it because of the reputations of uh these groups now this is the original uh mobilizing structure mobilizing structure that uh we are trying to uh, create a really concrete narrative we are trying to have a um leadership structure that uh, helps to mobilize people what we witness in reality is 
uh, during the umbrella movement, a lot of people, they are actually not affiliating with any kinds of this group. They are not receiving any message or narrative from these groups. Um, in one of the academic survey that are done uh, between the during the umbrella movement was a lot of people they were actually self realizing themselves they're self organizing themselves uh, there is a huge check of decentralized movement so when people uh, when the activists when the protesters were asked that who they identify as a leader Actually, more than 34% of them identify the movement as leaderless. While at the same time, um, there are about 56% of people identify the student groups, which is the HKFS and the scholarism, as the leader. So you, you can say this is a huge uh, portion for um, protesters not identifying anyone as leader. And this is consistent to the social movement that emerged in these five years. So for example, in Egypt or in Tunisia or even in South Africa, in Occupy Wall Street movement, in Ukraine, Maidan Revolution, a lot of time we witness a more leaderless or at the same time leave a through movement because movement have a more horizontal uh, leadership structure. So everyone can be a leader. So it creates a problem, uh, which is the decisions making cannot channel to every actors of the movement. And there are uh, different interpretations of movement tactics. There are different preferences for um, uh, the objective of the movement. And a lot of time it cannot be reconciled by having one leader speaking on the stage or high by having one organization to trying to be a focal point uh, with the government. So uh, this is kind of uh, an experiment we had during the movement, and uh, which may give you some insight, I'll say. Um, what we are trying to do during the Umbrella movement is, first of all, uh, the newcomers of the movement, they did not affiliated with any leaders or organization, which is a challenge to a more structural based movement. What we trying to do at first is by trying to include, include more civil society groups. So by including more civil society groups in our decision making mechanisms, we hope that people will feel uh, they are being represented, which of course we failed. Um, so at the second stage, the protesters are not uh, identifying themselves as a member or um, trusting any organizations. So they gradually developed a alternative tactics for the movement and they hope that alternative tactics can be trained into real decision making or into real action. And what we are trying to do, uh, because it was a occupation and in the occupying zone, there was a, um, you can say a stage for the leaders, for organizations to uh, spread the message through uh, open mic. And what we do to accommodate uh, protesters' alternative tactics is by open up the stage to everyone. So at night, everyone can just uh, go up to the stage and express their opinion, trying to spread their opinions to the protester in the occupying zone. But it is not uh, quite equivalent to a um, more broader um, decision making because people just express their opinion. It doesn't bind to uh, other organizations or protesters. So of course, people are dissatisfied with this mechanism. So what we're trying to do at last at the first stage is when the protesters have already developed more ownerships to the movement, uh, we have to get their consensus. And by getting their consensus, we're trying to use a on-site voting systems. We have a electronic uh, referendum apps and uh, we're trying to get people to vote in the app uh, for two agenda. Uh, one of the agenda is uh, what are to try to come up with a unifying objective for the movement. But 
it was too late, I would say. Uh, a lot of people, they have already developed their own versions of tactics and strategy. And the agenda listed in the referendum cannot accommodate their expectations. This is the first obstacle. The second obstacle is how do you define uh, who has a vote? How do you determine who has a vote? So there were a huge debate on who can vote. Um, there is also potential risk or scare of being infiltrated by the pro government side. So the pro government people, they can send people to the occupying zone and vote for and sabotage the on-site voting. So eventually we have to abandon these ideas of on-site uh, consensus uh, making uh, mechanisms. And the lesson we learned during the Umbrella Movement, uh, the Umbrella Movement eventually we didn't uh, achieve a institutional reform and uh, this caused a lot of distrust with the leaderships or even organizational space based it of movement and um, the lesson we learn from the environment movement is a lot of time we're trying to see a movement as a more hierarchical as a more structural based organizational based movement that uh, decision making can channel from one decision making groups to some of the brokers to some of the civil society groups and eventually to ordinary participants. It just doesn't work really work now because people uh, have more ownership uh, to the movement. So right now you can see the movement uh, uh, structure, structure like, like this, this. Uh, is quite uh, it's organic. quite organic. You can see you there are different parts in, in here, here. Uh, that, uh, that people uh, are formed by, by different small groups or small narrative small groups. groups. And they try to spread it to, to spread it. it. However, um, However um, um, a lot of time there are so many new newcomers are represented by this website. What we observe what we in observe the Umbra movement is Umbra movement people are not entirely opposing a leader-led leader movement. movement, but they need but their, they voice, need to be heard their voice to be heard by the decision by makers. The decision makers. So, for so, the uh, more networked uh, organizations, organizations, I think there is a urgent need for, for messengers or brokers or for search agents to the newcomers. The newcomers. And there should be and also, should be also a, a dialogue mechanism or grievances mechanism that can help direct those the newcomers to channel their opinions into the networked uh, structure based uh, decision making groups. And by having this dialogue, by having it will this at dialogue, least it will maintain sort of maintain solidarity, solo, solidarity, which are confirmed which are by Taiwan and Taiwan. And so, um, so we didn't actually we didn't employ this model, model in the environment movement. But if there are future there movements, are future movement, it's quite decentralized. It's quite decentralized and, uh, with a lot of newcomers. I think this is a model is that we're uh, trying. Uh, trying. So, so this is this is um, uh, my sharing. My sharing. Okay. Okay. So, uh, right, so now uh, right, can, right now we uh, can. Uh, Open the floor, open like the to people like if there uh, are, uh, if our if audience, our audience have questions, question, they can just leave their comment on the comment section. But for the panelists, uh, for we the panelists, can still discuss, we can still all, discuss uh, all, uh, our discussions. Our discussions. So, so yeah. yeah, who wants to start who first? To start first? Uh, uh, Jose or I think? Jose or I think? Um, okay. Uh, okay. Hello? Yeah. Hello. To respond to the first question raised by Jensen, I have to say that it's still very difficult to make the the public or me opinion um, yeah, to uh, use the deliberative discussion and make their opinions um, um, into the public decision. Yeah. So the only one thing we um, 
we do more clo close to the uh, to make it happen is is the discussion we hope uh, the, the public discussion about the cross uh, the monitoring act of the cross trade agreement. So we provide the NGOs uh, version the draft to the public on the street, and they can discuss the articles which which um, written by the, the the scholars, and they can make some suggestion and um, and revision after their discussion. So. At, at the about whole, um, I, I forgot how many hours, maybe four or five hours, and then they have their own version about the the, the monitoring uh, draft. So I yeah, will try to send their opinions to the parliament. So yeah, to so this is why uh, maybe one of the. <laughs> um, yeah, but but at at the most time you will see that although we have a lot of group discussion, but normally it's very difficult to combine these their opinions into the real <laughs> decision making. So such as when the representative, the decision making group, the twenty one representative people, they make the decision to. To leave the parliament, um, then the people on the street, most of most of the people, they when they are not participate the decision, they are some of them are criticized and or disappointed or they cannot accept the the result. So so after the the the, I remember yeah the second day when 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 the decision making. Um, make the announcement about how we are going to leave the occupation. Uh, then, then we hold we hold another uh, deliberative discussion on the Jinan road. Um, we try to make the public, um, can make a comment or other suggestion about the decision of leaving. So yeah, we try to hold a dialogue with the. Public, um, because, because uh, things, there are a lot of people that can accept the decision. So we want to uh, listen uh, what's their opinion and about the, the decision. But at the end, you will in the beginning, many many NGOs or maybe some individuals from the decision making are worried about if we open the discussion and maybe some. Some people, Some people will suggest that, that well, we should not should leave. <laughs> we should keep staying here. here. But, but it's very strange that when we open the discussion, it seems like there are not many people. They say no, we should keep staying um, in the parliament or outside of them. Actually, there are more and more people. They try to discuss what can we do after the. Um, if the when we, when we uh, yeah. finish the occupation, so sometimes you are thinking you are that thinking the public, their they are their opinion might be one way, but actually, actually sometimes they are they are, they are not the, the image that you are thinking about, and also like uh, when I talk about the there is an area in Taiwan. They call Jim in Jim Fang Xu. Yeah, we we also try to invite them or other more different NGOs to go on the street, on the stage, like the umbrella movement. Do. So we try to invite uh, different NGOs. We can speak different issues, labor issues or other issues, um, like forced eviction issues. Um, on the stage, we would try to um, connect all different issues together and. Make the people think that all of these social issues are not um, are not um, separate or um, not uh, are not are not um, irrelevant. Actually, they are connected um, together. So, like environmental issues, sometimes it's also um, connect with human rights issues or yeah, even yeah, the public. So. 
Yeah, we try to do that, but sometimes, that, but sometimes some angels they, they refuse to, to go on the stage. They, they want their own. Yeah, they don't want they, they don't want to go on the stage. So yeah, so but we, we try to do that. We try to do that. And also, I want to make that um, there is another technique being used uh, during the sunflower movement. It's there because uh, during the sunflower movement there are a lot of technical guys. Um, they try to provide some um, technical service, so like like they set up a web uh, a website which can um, they can they can web, they can web, how to say web, webcast the three different uh, menu of the sunflower movement because we have three different venues of the movement. One is inside the apartment and. The other two parties in Qingdao and Jinan Ro. So they try to webcast the all the three part um, symptom um, in the same time. So you can see what happened on the two different um, venues. And also they uh, the some some people if they cannot participate um, on the street, then they also can like tap something on the website or yeah, say something on online. So I think it's also a way. But but we didn't we didn't organize a a voting mechanism like Hong Kong do. So so yeah I have to say although we tried the deliberative um discussion, we try to make this as a way to collaborate more um, public opinions through 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 the method. But sometimes it's still very difficult when when we face the decision making. <laughs> usually, it seems like it's yeah because usually when you have to make a decision, you will have a time limitation and <laughs> a lot of things. So yeah, so you will see that a lot of decision uh, usually is still made by the um, the. The group I mentioned before is the two, uh, the, the ten, the ten uh, NGO representative and ten uh, student representative. Um, mm -hmm. They are yeah the group. They make most of the decisions. So yeah. So I have so, to say so one one quick one one quick uh, question uh, that is um, when. Before the liberation song, which is the Jinming Jie Fong Chu, uh, the liberation, and also uh, um, uh, and also the open mic, the open mass meeting, were people more grievances and more challenging to the movement leaderships? Uh, does the liberation helps to kind of uh, calming down people anger or grievances to a more hierarchical structure movement? Mm, well, the deliberative discussion um, on the area of the Jinan Ro uh, in front of the stage. Mm -hmm. uh, usually, we we will um, have some um, like a facilitator, so they can um, they can uh, control how long will it take. Because sometimes we we have to. It, it's not a we still have to we try to conclude um, what's the opinion. So it is impossible. We open the discussion to one whole day discussion is impossible. Mm -hmm. Usually we will um, we will have a um, host or a, a facilitator who will um, try to organize the group discussion among two, uh, different groups. So I think it, mm -hmm. uh, usually it helped. To make the uh, general public on the street, they can speak out. But um, yeah, for for the Jianmin Jiefangqu, actually, I think they are, they are still criticized about the the main uh, leadership. So they don't want to participate the discussion. They have their own um, side event. <laughs> so they have mm -hmm. they have their own um, strategy. They have their own um demand yeah so i think that that's their that's their 
yeah, that's their right. So they, they can do that um, if they don't want to join the the major path. Then, yeah, although it's a movement that, but I think the movement is combined with a lot of different people and different groups. So everyone can have their own opinions yeah, mm. and have to mm. respond to their own decision. So like the March 24, the, some people, they, they, they start to criticize about why we keep sitting on the street is is useless. So um, so they encourage people that maybe we should um, do something more um, more active or more um, yeah. So 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 they encourage people to go into the executive unit, and then at the end, the the police was. Um, um, was arrested a lot of students and beaten a, a bit a lot of um, people. So um, yeah, so so th that's that's another strategy and another decision making. But yeah, you have to face the result. Hmm. Yeah, <laughs> by <laughs> although maybe 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 they are still. Um, Maybe like the media or other people, maybe they, they, they cannot figure out which there are so many different groups uh, among the movement. They still think all, all of the things are all organized by Lin Fei Ban or Chen Wei Ting. But actually, yeah, in fact, there are a lot of different individuals and different groups inside. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, what about Jose? Yeah, um, so you asked me three questions. Um, the first one about how, so let me get my video on. So the first one about how we get people who aren't, actually the first question I should ask is, you're talking about how we represent um, the, the voices of people. Yeah, um, so the one interesting thing is that Fees was all would never claim um, to represent anyone and and we did that for a particular reason because of the political dynamic of it and the way we organized the movement that mm -hmm. each university was quite autonomous so we never claimed to represent anyone but how we did represent everyone if I had to use inverted commas was by using a moral argument and trying to argue that moral argument and Essentially, by doing that, you create two sides where you either like our argument or you don't like our argument. And then we would represent the people who like our arguments. And so that's it's how we. Sorry? Polarization. Yeah, essentially. Our, our movement was intended to polarize. Um, and that was the, the, the purpose behind it. So it would become off, awfully, not awfully, awfully is not the right word. Um, it would become extremely polarized, especially around race. It became extremely polarized, especially around gender, um, as a way for the movement to grow. Um, in some, so I'll give you an example. Acknowledging, for those who don't know, South Africa's um, racial past, race is a very, very big factor in South Africa. It's not something you can ignore or say you should get over. It's ever present simply because of the history of the country. So often you would have some universities of fees must fall saying that a fees must fall here can't accept any students who are white and you have to be black to be part of the movement. Yeah. A fees must fall movement at another university will say it doesn't really matter what race you are, but we should be fundamentally thinking about gender as well. So if you are what people would call a show, uh, what the phrase that became very, very popular was a uh, hyper-masculine, patriarchal character, you weren't allowed to speak, essentially. And there was a concerted effort to ensure that, and it, it was really dependent on the political party that had more sway at a particular university, what ideology was dominant at that university, and that, that changed. But on a national level, the movement was intended to say, we want to polarize because we want to discussion and we want to force debate on this issue around um, funding of universities in South Africa. 
And we believe that we are sitting on the right side of the debate. And our job is to convince more people to join our side. And if you join our side, you're not saying that Fees Must Fall represents me. You're saying that I agree with what Fees Must Fall is doing. Now, Fees Must Fall might then go across and do a particular protest action. And people will say, well, I agree with your underlying issue. I agree with your moral argument that you're making here, but I disagree with your tactics. And things like that happen all the time. Um, but we try to shy away from simply saying, these are the people that we represent, simply because of the reason we're, um, we're extremely autonomous. Um, it would be hard to say we represent X, Y, Z. In fact, we had a situation where one of the universities, as a tactic, this happened last year, as the university management's tactic to get around the issue, so to get around um, to essentially show that Fees Must Fall isn't representative of all students, they held a referendum at the university. And the referendum was about who wants to come back to university, so who wants to end the shutdown. Now that referendum, the majority came out and said, we want the shutdown to end. Now that, that doesn't say we don't agree with Fees Must Fall. It's saying that we disagree with the particular tactic Fees Must Fall Sorry. Okay. I, Hi, yeah. Sorry. I, yeah, I just got caught off there. So I was just saying that um, even though students came out, the majority said, we don't believe in the tactic of fees must fall. The argument that fees must fall, the fees must fall movement still made was, yes, you might not agree with our tactic, right? But that doesn't mean that we're going to stop what we're doing. Now, mm -hmm. this works in some universities, it doesn't work at others. But at that university, it actually worked. Um, and once again, it was all about how you control the narrative. Um, and that was more important than who do you represent, because we thought the, the end outcome was beneficial. Now, that has its own holds, and it has its own discussion about the merits of that. And even I, at times, sit on the fence about it. Um, how long our mass meetings are? <laughs> uh, you have to be a very patient person. Um, you would have meetings that would last some meetings were very very efficient and what i've learned now is you have to always have really good chairs a good chair of a meeting can make what is could become an eight hour long meeting into a two hour long two hour long meeting um so that's my first like piece of advice is always make sure that you have a very seasoned strong and well respected chair um, some of the delays for us wasn't necessarily trying to get every single person's view or opinion. The delays came when the chair lost track of the discussion or um, people didn't respect, didn't believe the chair was a legitimate person to chair a meeting and then there would be a discussion around who's the legitimate person to, to chair the meeting and that's its own meeting within a meeting. So always have a very, very good chair. Um, the other one is to always have a clear running agenda. So often people just say you have an agenda, but we will always have a running agenda. And within the occupied space that you're using, anyone new who comes in, it's not the idea that often people say, oh, you should know what we discussed six hours ago. Why are you bringing up this issue again? <laughs> it's the responsibility of the house to constantly be reflecting and making sure any person who's new in the space has easy access to previous decisions that were made and the rationale behind them. Because mm -hmm. sometimes someone will come in and say, I know you've made these decisions, but I don't agree with it and try to have a rationale for it. Now, they might just be repeating someone else's argument. We don't take the stance though of even if someone, so you try and prevent people coming up and repeating questions. But we took the stance of even if someone repeats a question, you don't shut them down. Um, what was beautiful at the same time was that we ended up living in spaces for an extended period of time. Um, so the meeting could 
let me say this properly, because it was a student-based movement and not a civil society movement, the constituency that we're working with was students primarily, and a lot of the students already stayed on campus. Um, so all we said to the students was, well, instead of going home to go sleep there, we can provide the opportunity for you to sleep in the location of our meeting, and we can wake up tomorrow morning and keep on going. So we avoided the need of having complete outsiders coming in and saying, oh my word, why is this meeting eight hours long? Um, you just had a continuous meeting that would happen and make decisions on the fly. Um, so even though you would have long meetings, it didn't feel that long for some people, and it wasn't disruptive. Now, that is my personal view, <laughs> mm. <laughs> because I'm very, very patient. I do know there are people who believe that we should have quicker meetings. I don't think quicker meetings are necessarily more efficient meetings. Um, and there's a discussion to be had about that now. As I said, because we're primarily, and this is to your, the first question that you asked about how we control that space and who gets to speak in that space, because we were primarily students, it is easier to tell who is a student in a room from who's not a student, because most people will know each other or would have seen each other on campus. So that was the one, and this is just like face value stereotyping of what a student should look like, essentially. So that was the first. The second was we never allowed media in um, into the building. Uh, we were very, very conscious of um, tweeting. So we were constantly following Twitter during the meeting. Um, so essentially, if someone said something or tweeted something in the meeting, um, because if, if you're an outsider, it's easier for the outsider to say, well, I don't really care. If you tweet something at the next meeting or during the meeting, you'll be called out where someone will say, well, X, Y, Z has just made a comment. Who, is, who knows this particular person? And you'll find them very, very quickly. And you create this collective responsibility around how we keep the discussion internal. Mm -hmm. um, but if new people come in to the space, we would never kick them out of the space because we realize the power of the narrative and making sure people don't see us as people who don't have any sort of organization, who don't know, who don't have any sort of, who are seen as like radical, rebellious children, essentially, who haven't thought about the action that they've made. So we always open up our door, except to the media, because the media is a different matter in itself, but we open up our doors to anyone who wants to come and see how the process unfolds. Um, now, obviously, it doesn't work all the time, um, but because of the nature of the movement, the student-based nature of the movement, we weren't too afraid about anyone infiltrating the space. What we more, were more afraid of was the state, not just infiltrating the space, but tapping our phones and using our communications against us. That was, that was a bigger fear um, than if someone comes into our meeting um, at all. Um, but yeah, mm. sorry. That's my, my short answer to those three questions. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I feel like, um, I'm sorry, how should I put it? Okay, so a lot of time there are a lot of criticisms against horizontal uh, leadership structures or horizontal participation of movement. And the reason of those criticisms is because they feel uh, the people who participate in the positions might not be rational or uh, they would be too radical or being uh, very polarized to come up with any consensus. But then, uh, then uh, it's actually from it's actually your experience, from your experience of, uh, of uh, free muscle uh, free and also from the Sun Fowl movement, movement, when people they, they are being put they are into being a, a space of dialogue, of dialogue or being put or into a space of meeting, they can they actually, can actually learn, learn and, uh, and uh, adjust their behavior adjust their into, a, into a. a, a, a into like seeking into, consensus, like, seeking with, consensus the with the others. And, and this is how, this is how I think, I think, think this is very important, I think, in a horizontal in a structure horizontal movement, movement, that is the dialogue between, between actors, actors and uh, it and, actually uh, will help to facilitate um, um, the, con uh, the consensus, the consensus and and to come up with at least some thoughts of decision making.
Well, I would like to know in the famous world of business, when you have such a decentralized movement that each of those 18 universities can add their own, who is the focal point with the government? Is it the university administrations? Are they the anchor of knowledge? So it depends on the situation at hand. Primarily, our focus is on, I'm not sure if my video is on, there we go. Primarily, the focus is on the university administration. Um, and, the, and there's a logic behind that. I think there were only two major protests, three major protests that went up against the state. Um, and that, and those are like for very unique reasons. Um, two were up against the one protest march to the parliament of the country, and a protest march to the union buildings of the country, and one protest march to the offices of the ruling party. But those were for like very unique um, reasons. The focus of the movement now is to put pressure on the university administration. And the idea is that you want, because remember I said the core idea, the core demand, we believe has some sort of moral significance. Um, so the core demand of free decolonial education, of free education, we think is the best thing for society in many, many ways. Um, but we needed the university administration to also take on and internalize that belief. So the protest was about how to make the university administration and management take our beliefs and internalize them as university policy. And the logic behind that was, if you get the universities to do that across the country, it is then easier to go into discussions with the government around how we then start funding this particular issue. So we didn't want to go and pressurize government and get to a meeting with government and we're sitting there as these students government and university leaders, or we call them vice chancellors of a university, with the vice chancellors of the university saying, we disagree with students. Um, it would be a lot stronger if the university vice chancellors and students say, we agree on this one particular issue and we're coming united towards um, the government. Now, why we chose protest as a form of action is because previous forms of negotiating and discussing with university management around tuition and fees on a yearly basis continuously broke down. So you would go into a university discussion with, with good intentions and goodwill, but most of the times you would get the, the wrong end of the deal, essentially. So the shift towards protest action as a form of negotiating was predicated on the belief that universities aren't on our side when it comes to this issue. And we will then, instead of negotiating with them, we will try and force them to join our side by giving our argument in an amplified manner. So instead of having the argument in a boardroom, um, you have your argument on public mass meetings where university, and, it, and it's a pressure tactic. It's to say in a mass meeting, you sh as the vice chancellor of the university, should be able to publicly say why you're not willing to undertake this policy position. And the policy position is often like a very harsh one. In the context of South Africa, fees is a very exclusionary form of policy. It, it, to be financially excluded from the university is devastating for a lot of students um, in the country because of the, the form of, and like I said, I don't want to go into too many details about the underlying and the structure and the history of the country, but South Africa suffers from structural unemployment and ridiculously high inequality and entrenched poverty. But one of the few keys of getting out of that is the university space. And the majority of students who are at university can't afford university. So to create the space of the one opportunity for them to escape poverty and bring their family out of poverty, to say that you get financially excluded from that opportunity, even though academically you're very, very strong, was something that is very, very hard to defend as a university. And that was a tactic. If you get the university on your side, 
um, we can then go to the government and make the government say that we are fine with the policy that both, no, make the, you know, make the government say we are against the policy that both students and university management are for. So because of that, we restricted our protest to university spaces unless we needed a national platform to pressure universities and then would leave a university space. So you protest your universities, if you needed a national platform to talk about your issue, to put national pressure on a university, then we would leave the university space and protest in a major intersection or major avenue and disrupt something. So that was the logic of where we located our protest. Mm, I see. I see. <laughs> Before we wanting up, wanting up these sections, uh, I want to make sure that every panelist, uh, um, are there any further discussions? Um, I, the only thing I could say is that thank you for, yeah. for yeah. hosting this session. It was quite interesting to hear your different views. And I will definitely be emailing you both. Hopefully I can get Ealing's, I've got Ealing's email. I might email you both just to have okay. Okay. ongoing conversations. But essentially, I. <laughs> I think the biggest takeaway is horizontal leadership structures shouldn't be adopted for the sake of horizontal leadership. Hmm. And sometimes you do need to have a very strong opinion on an issue and get the right structure to solve the problems and not be stuck in old structures simply because they worked in the past. I really I appreciate, appreciate both of you, of you all, your experiences and your insights. And it makes me feel like that actually, although we are from different regions or country, as organizers, our struggles are similar. And um, there are so many obstacles of having a, a more concrete organization now. And with uh, the increasing trends of decentralized movement, it's worth looking um, to how do we spread the narratives in uh, how, in order to maintain one principles or two principles of the movement um how should we channel the message between uh, some of the organizer or decision making groups to the participants and finally how do we use the advantages of the centralized movement and create momentum that can channel a uh, meaningful and also um, meaningful achievement and um, so these discussions have to go on and I'm really looking forward to keep uh, in touch with you all. And um, I would also like to thank you, the audience that are with us today. And I uh, hope we can see each other again and have other, another online discussions. So thank you all and um, good morning and good night. <laughs> good morning, bye. Bye.